let's pivot to kind of leveraging your knowledge, uh, what you are seeing, what you're thinking. So let's first start with, you know, we've kind of, we're past COVID now. As you think about 2023, what are your thoughts in the risk environment? And more particularly, what would you say are your top priorities as you think about 2023? Yeah, so put simply, my key priority right now is getting deeper with our risk assessments, both from a perspective of understanding the nth parties that might potentially be involved, but also going beyond entity level risk assessments and really getting down to service or product level risk assessments. I would say that the reason for this is because our customers and regulators are demanding increasingly detailed information on how we're leveraging third parties in the operation of our business and about how those third parties themselves are operating in the specific context of our business and our specific customers. You know, one of the challenges that I see with that is really that expanding the scope of our risk assessments and our risk management process we're constrained like pretty much everybody else by the triple constraints model, you know, cost, time, and quality. Yep. Time and cost start to become a really serious factor. And it's really never been more of a focus for my program managing costs than right now. And neither has time. You know, we're seeing business stakeholders become more vocal that risk management must not be allowed to inhibit our speed to market. And in order to enable our business to support our customers, while also ensuring that our control objectives are met, we really have to be able to balance what we're doing in risk management and what our business is doing to support our customers and to generate revenue in a really a grand bargain of sorts. And as a risk management leader, you know that is huge for me, ensuring that the way forward that we land on can do both. No, I think that's it's a good way to explain both the challenge and potential solution, which is, you know, you think about time and cost and you cannot uh, subjugate quality, but time and cost, big drivers, because that's what the business is asking for. You just said something, Vince, that I think is critical to kind of stand out. What you said was, it's not enough to just monitor or manage or assess the risk of the third party, but, you have to relate that to the services that they're providing. And let me put another kind of layer on top of that. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Vince, which is also the location aspect as you put on it, right? So talk to us a little bit about, as you start to layer these, you know, again, what other challenges is it adding? And if you have any thoughts on solutions that you're considering, or you think that people should pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, really, as third parties, service providers continue to become more distributed in how they're offering services, that location aspect becomes very critical. However, it needs to be very specific to how your firm is interacting with those third parties. Continuous monitoring providers, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, really have the ability to potentially overwhelm you with information. And that's where our risk operations center really plays a key pivotal role in kind of translating the, the bolus of external data that's now becoming available about third parties and really mapping that to what we're doing with that. Yeah. So for instance, it's really key to understand where your exposures specifically are with that vendor. While we would not want there to be any natural disasters, for instance, if there was an earthquake in Mexico that impacted manufacturing for a supplier and we were to receive an alert about that, it would be important and incumbent on my organization to ensure that we're seeing what our exposure to that potential disaster in Mexico that's impacting manufacturing is, making sense of that yeah. information and translating that in a way that our business can use for decision support is, I think, the, the secret sauce to getting yeah. that right. Um, and, and also, I would say that there's a, a kind of a second factor here, which goes to resiliency. Um, understanding concentration risk and understanding, again, the engagements that your firm has with a supplier can kind of help you 
when there are these geographic type of impacts or risk events, really discern whether or not your business will be impacted and whether or not you need to sound the alarm. Because what I don't want to do, especially as we continue to monitor more and more risks and gain access to more and more information, is to cry wolf. I don't yeah. want to yeah. lose the belief of my stakeholders by alerting them too often. Yeah, so Vitz, I think this is a great advice to both solutions, but also the role of solutions plus the risk group like yours at large enterprises, which is, hey, it's not enough just to know what's happening, what that risk is, but is it relevant to me? And if it's rele relevant to me, what actionable insights do I as a risk group provide to my business so that they can actually know or take actions around, it, right? So you said a few other things as you were talking about it. You know, Vince, in the, like even a few years ago, when I would talk to risk leaders or even procurement leaders, often they were not thinking beyond what is the financial health and what is the cyber health of my third party or my supplier, right? And now as we think about that, it's just not enough to think about just the financial and the cyber health, but you need to understand sanctions and you need to understand location. Talk to us a little bit about how has risk profession kind of evolved from just the concentrated thinking of a limited risk to now saying, hey, you need to look at its full spectrum. Yeah, and you, you kind of hit a tool on the two main risk domains that I think every third party risk management program is overly indexed on, which is financial and cyber. In addition to financial and cyber, I think it's increasingly important to monitor, for instance, the physical security of suppliers that will be storing our sensitive data. I know that for some, you know, certain small aspects of physical security roll up underneath their cyber due diligence. But for me, it's much more than that. And really, I think that this extends, especially in firms with uh, significant um I would say with many large customers, large enterprise customers, those customers are increasingly expecting firms like mine to ensure, to exercise due care, to yeah. ensure that suppliers have a strong physical security hygiene, because if you have all the cybersecurity in the world, but the physical controls are extremely lacking, you know, that pretty much invalidates any potential protection that the strong yeah. cyber controls might have. You know, another area that we're monitoring are privacy risks. Again, yeah. privacy is sometimes lumped up underneath cybersecurity, but as regulators increasingly focus on privacy, I mean, I think we saw that uh, White Castle, the hamburger chain, is facing like a $17 billion privacy fine or something crazy. I had to read that twice just to make sure it was billion with a B. Um you know, it really drives the importance of going deeper on privacy risk management. And I think this is borne out by the fact that there are now tools like Supply Wisdom, which are treating privacy like a separate risk domain as its own, as it should be. And maybe the final area tool that I would mention would be ESG risks. Yeah, I yeah. think that, um, you know, many events have happened in the market that are driving the importance of ESG risk management up, but none more so than investor demand for that information. And as a result, uh, I think you're probably very aware that the SEC has now changed the requirements for ESG disclosures for public companies. And as a public company, the firm that I work at includes ESG in their 10K filings. So now when you have this combination of extremely focused regulation from, you know, a very aggressive regulator and our exposure and partnerships to and with third parties, you put those together. Now, all of a sudden, you know, managing ESG risk of your supplier base rockets up the chart in terms of importance. Yeah. No, Vince, I think you brought you bring up a very good point about ESG. And I, I think one would say is, you know, not specifically talking about your organization, but your you know, organization like yours have actually been taking proactive steps to making sure that you are not just looking at your own ESG practices, but in your case, holding you responsible, or I should say, you know, in charge of ensuring what some would call in greenhouse gas emissions scope three is, hey, what is beyond that? What is the ESG status 
of the locations I'm getting services from or solutions from, products from, and also what is the ESG status of my third parties. Talk to us, Vince, about as a risk leader, you know, you're seeing these increasing requirements of risk management, right? From financial cyber to compliance, to privacy, and now ESG. Talk to us a little bit about how you are managing from a information labor effort perspective and how you're left, you know, maybe is some of it being benefit from the from having new solutions like continuous monitoring coming to you? Yeah, so the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, really having a foundational baseline that helps illustrate, demonstrate, visualize what our absolute requirements are is critical. Risk management, in my experience, you know, across the across various industries, is sometimes seen as non-value add and requires a lot of justification. Being able to explicitly detail what we are required to do, what we are expected to do, and what would be nice to do are all kind of, that's kind of my three lines of defense in a way, because what I build my program for is what we're required to do. And that's where, you know, our regulatory requirements come in, the various requirements of our customers, layering on to that are the industry best practices. You know, as you noted, continuous monitoring products are really changing the game in terms of what we are able to do and what we would like to do because the information that continuous monitoring partners such as supply wisdom and other you know, you know that's more specialized opening up new doors kind of, um, and opening and new paths that we risk would products never like financial be health able to accomplish instance. on our own with the resourcing that we have and the supplier base that we're entrusted to manage. So I would say that one of the ways that we're leveraging continuous monitoring tools in our arsenal is by working with our procurement department to ensure that each third-party engagement has a designated owner with day-to-day -day operational responsibility and knowledge. Because what that allows us to do, as I had touched on earlier, is truly act as a clearinghouse for risk intelligence. You know, our risk operations center is underpinned by a GRC platform, which I think that really that's the key to being successful, having a strong GRC platform, because that automation allows you to bring in the various risk alerts and intelligence from various providers and channel that directly to those frontline people in the business. And as we had talked about earlier, how it's so important to contextualize, to translate yeah. the yeah. risk intelligence that you're getting from your partners into something that's germane to your business. Having that linkage between who owns an engagement with a third party specifically, you know, and yeah. I don't mean like the champion, the executive champion or the budget owner, but who day to day is working with that supplier. We're able to vet an alert and choose whether or not to send it directly to that person. And what we're now seeing is that we're able to move at the speed of the business while also helping to shape, I would say, decision strategy with intelligence and information that our business owners and managers would not normally have access to. Yeah. I think that um, you know when you think about what's on the mind of somebody in, in a business unit, you know it, it's the requirements of their customer. Yeah. They're not overly focused on scanning Google alerts, for instance, um, for information about yeah. the third parties they may be working with. That's yeah. a role that continuous monitoring really helps us play and fill in. I think, Vincent, you described a really good model that people should remember because we're not seeing it necessarily implemented across uh, enterprises, which is your GRC TPRM platform is your source of where all this data is captured including your assessments where continuous monitoring is integrated. And then you have a risk operation center, which is your risk group that is actually taking that and ensuring that it's specifically actions that within the company. But the final piece you just talked about also is, hey, who is the connect to that third party that actually has the knowledge of the third party that also becomes a participant in that program? Then you can actually completely close the chain. 
Yeah, and that's really a tool been a supreme focus of my organization over the last year or two, and we're calling it vendor governance oversight. And what we're working to do is to build a governance framework that doesn't take the managerial tasks of a third party out of the business. That's where I think they belong. You know, KPI measurement, SLA measurement, yep. contractual term enforcement. You know, that's best done on the front lines by the people who are working with these suppliers and who know the relationships. What we're trying to build for and to solve for is really building a framework that ensures that not only engagements with third parties have defined owners, but that, for instance, the various uh, third party focused elements of our corporate policies and requirements have controls in place that are part of our enterprise control library. And what we're really working now is we're extending our due diligence where we you know, conduct inherent risk assessments, conduct focused due diligence based on the outcomes of those inherent risk assessments, and then open findings and you know, basically then enroll that supplier in our continuous monitoring. We're extending that process now, not just to due diligence, but also to due care. Because I think that too often in firms, you know, I think a lot of us have been guilty of this or, or know scenarios where this happens. When that contract with a third party is executed, it's turned over by the procurement organization to that business unit, to that initial requester. And once risk management has conducted their risk assessment, unless continuous monitoring shows something, I don't think there's additional focus. And so what this opens up is a blind spot between onboarding and offboarding. And by building this framework that I'm describing, what we're looking to do is as a result of what we find in our due diligence and the potential findings we might open, this new frontier is then having controls based on the control objectives of our existing corporate policies that we would apply automatically with our GRC platform based on the inherent risk or even the residual risk of that engagement we would then test those controls. So it's not enough, I feel, now to just gain assurance that, for instance, cybersecurity requirements are being met and to rely on outside-in views that companies like Supply Wisdom can provide. Going to that next level is creating a framework that enables folks in the business in a lightweight and non-distracting way to ensure that our third parties are actually doing what they signed up to do? Are they actually encrypting sensitive data with an appropriate cipher strength? Are they encrypting that data at rest and in transit? Um, yeah. Privacy, for instance, you know, there are a number of different risk domains that lend themselves to this type of control development. And what I would say where continuous monitoring hooks into that is if there is some sort of material event yeah. We're then able to leverage this framework to gain assurance that in the wake of an event, say a breach, that we are still protected, that the yeah. controls that we've defined are still in operation and that our customers' data, our employees' data, our sensitive technical data, that all that is secure. Yeah, Vince, you, you described that actually really well. And I think that's a that's a really leading practice. And if it's done thoughtfully and engage with the business prior to putting into place, you're actually not just doing good risk management, but you're actually focusing on resiliency also at the same time. Yeah, and, you, and a tool as you hit on, it's really with the engagement of the business. We yeah. leverage an, an internal survey, which is called the integrity survey. And it's anonymous, you know, it's non-retaliatory. And basically what we use with the integrity, the purpose of the integrity survey is for everyone in our business to answer some questions about how they feel their ability to do their work with integrity is and what they feel the, the performance, how, how much integrity people around them are performing their work with. And what this allows our compliance and ethics teams to do is to hone, on, hone in on potential areas of improvement and the reason I mentioned this survey a tool is because in the last running, in quarter three of last year, a number of the verbatim responses uh, included things like, I manage vendors on a day-to-day -day basis, and I don't really have a lot of guidance. I'm not really sure how I should be managing this vendor 
I, and one person even said, I feel as though I'm screwing up every day. And so, you know, really engaging the business and building this framework, it actually takes a lot of the effort out because it's a very prescriptive routine that says, you know, if you're having a vendor who has access to our facilities, for instance, every year, make sure that they're background checking their employees when they bring them on. Make sure that um, they have legitimate credentials that we are managing in a timely fashion. And yeah. it, it takes the business away from having to um, having to essentially uh, do that guesswork on their own. Yeah. No, I think, Vince, again, you, know, you described a, a practice, a discipline, a process, leveraging of tools really well that would enable risk managers to do why they signed up for that role, which is actually you know, risk mitigation, risk advice, and not just risk identification, right? So in this, this is a case where the, with the number of risk vectors rising, if you don't put a process like what you have put into place with the tools you put into place, your risk managers are just not gonna be efficient. And if you want them to have speed, do it at lower cost with high quality, you have to be able to do that. Let me ask you a last question on capabilities and then Vince, anything you think that risk managers should know that I haven't asked you is what's, what are your thoughts on application or leveraging of AI and tools like that? Yeah, so when it comes to AI, a tool specifically generative AI, we're right at the beginning of the hockey stick when it comes not only to hype, but also to legitimate use cases. I think that generative AI is going to have much more of an impact on risk management than previous buzzwords of the year, like, for instance, blockchain, which, as yeah. we saw, didn't really materialize at all in risk management. In the immediate short term, I see generative AI being used by service providers to respond to questionnaires, which are, you know, for better or worse, still the foundational building block of pretty much all TPRM programs. Yeah. In the longer term, I mean, I'm going to use a sci-fi reference here, but I definitely see conversations between AIs like Neuromancer and Wintermute from the book Neuromancer for any sci-fi fans, um, <laughs> where initial questionnaire-based assessments are conducted between outsourcers and service providers automatically. You know, that might be a way off, but probably not too far. ChatGPT is already, you know, burning up the news cycles and showing us the power of generative AI for text creation. Imagine... If a firm that has to respond to many security questionnaires has a generative AI that's been trained on that firm's security controls, I think yeah. it could do a pretty decent job at eliminating the need for a human to respond to those questionnaires while still providing the same product that a human would, or at the very least, I think that an AI could prepare that questionnaire and then a human could review it and submit it back to their customer. Um, and what I think is really a prime example of how AI will augment humans. I don't think that uh, you know AI is coming for our jobs and risk management, but I also do think that it's going to help us do more with less and make the humans that we do employ much more capable and consistent. Vince, I think that's the best answer I've had on this question of anybody, because not only did you kind of talk about a very specific use, actually, it's a beautiful use that uh, I, I hope providers are working on, which is, you know, you're answering all these surveys constantly. There may be variations in the question, but if you train that, that AI, you can actually respond to all of it. And now humans are focusing on answering only the more complex issues. So I think the AI plus human for me, I'm very, very optimistic about that, right? And so a contribution of both AI plus human gets better over, over a period of time. So all uh, definitely keep an eye on it. Vince, was, was there anything else in risk management? I'll talk about career and career advice at the next point, but is there anything else I should have asked you or any advice that you have for risk managers as they're building programs? Yeah, I mean, I think a tool when we're talking about AI, for instance, you know, that's kind of one of the major kind of flashpoints of technological change in third-party risk management. But I think if we also 
you know, want to take a look at another one, that would be GRC platforms. Yeah. I think that when you see the rise of not only SaaS offerings of GRC platforms, but on-prem ones as well, it really underscores the importance of having any sort of GRC platform as part of your TPRM program. I think that in fact, when you look at, you know, a five kind of five-step maturity matrix for, for third-party risk management, I don't think you can get above a two level of maturity without one. I think that if you don't have a GRC platform, you're basically leveraging spreadsheets and paper questionnaires. And what we're doing with GRC here at Verizon, we're in the midst of actually a major GRC transformation that will bring all of our risk management, compliance, and assurance functions onto one shared platform. We're really using that shared platform to increase the value of what we're doing and to elevate third-party risk management beyond just simple box checking. You know, we had talked earlier in our conversation about the amazing amount of data that third-party providers like Supply Wisdom are generating on a daily basis that's focused on our supplier base. Without a GRC platform to feed that into actioning on, analyzing, assessing the information, it's just, it would be extremely time-consuming. And by having a GRC platform at the heart of our risk operations center model, what we're able to do is for some levels of alert, we can drive automated decisions with no human interaction. There are some notifications that are so severe, like for instance, a data breach where our company's name or the names of our customers or partners of ours are, are located, we can channel that directly to that frontline business owner that I referred to earlier. Yeah. Whereas, you know, another example would be we can also open up a finding automatically against that supplier, which then initiates action. It's yeah. not just informational only at that point. We're now, I mean, we're going to blast that information out to the business and help them stay informed and you know, make sure they, they start that conversation and drive that conversation with a supplier about what our potential impact is. But we're also able to, with an audit trail, start an action process, which will hopefully um, realize the mitigation, yeah. the elimination of any potential impact from the event that we detected. And I think if you're intelligent about how you build out your GRC platform, you can realize all of that with no human intervention. Fitz, I'm so glad you brought it up. You know, I wrote an article in Forbes two years ago, and it was titled The Future of Risk Management is Automated, right? And it's specifically, my vision at that point in time was, you know, we were already automating risk identification full spectrum, but the piece that was not automated was risk mitigation. And like you said, if you were to combine your continuous monitoring and your GRC together well, you can actually, like you just said, you can trigger automated action so that humans are focused on the most complex issue, not the ones you talked about. And you can actually increase the speed to action by automating all that. So I'm really, really glad that you actually brought that up. So Vince, let's uh, move to the final piece of our discussion.